Welcome, welcome, welcome. Oh, do I have a story for you. So, um, I had a meeting today with a couple of young women who were needing some counsel and they came and I just sat there and chatted with them and one of them said um, that she was starting a class online and that in her apartment she just got internet and she was thrilled but she had to go and buy a tablet so that she could complete the class or participate in the class she could do it on her phone but that was really hard <clears throat> so I asked her how much a tablet was and she said it's about a hundred dollars I went a hundred dollars she said yeah for a nice tablet you can get it for a hundred dollars and I reach into my pocket and I pull out a hundred dollar bill now why is it so significant because the Lord this morning told me to put a hundred dollar bill in my pocket. I specifically heard him say, put a hundred dollars in your pocket and just hold on to it until I tell you what to do with it. So this morning, I just put that hundred in my pocket, slipped it in, went on to the office, worked on this TV show, worked on studying for it and praying over it. And then knowing that I had this meeting, and I had no idea what God was going to do with that hundred, but I knew that he had a purpose for me to put it in my pocket. And so I gave it to her, and she, no, 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 I don't, you, no, please don't make me take it. I don't want it. Yes, you need to take it because it's not from me. It's from the Lord. The Lord loves you. He loves to take care of you, and he wants you to have this. This is from him. And she took it reluctantly, but was blessed by it. It wasn't a, a, a bad reluctance. It was a humbled reluctance. And I said, you now have a story to tell. You, you have, see, this hundred is a story that you get to tell that you had a need and God heard your need and he had it already taken care of before you even knew it. The Lord had taken care of your need for a tablet. And he heard you and he blessed you. I'm just the conduit to the vessel through which God got you his love and blessing. And that's the story she gets to tell. And she was so excited to be able to go and tell that story. And the other young woman sitting with her said, this was God and I'm a witness to it. I'm a witness she was, and so she gets to tell the story also. That's why, that's why I love the Lord. It's one of the reasons I just, I'm so marveling at him. I marvel and I'm astonished that he speaks. I'm overwhelmed that he speaks to me and I'm humbled that he uses me for his purposes. You never know how far a $100 bill story can go. But I know this one's going to go far. And then he is going to receive so much glory over this story. I'm encouraging you. I'm encouraging you that when God speaks to you, do it. Because the blessing isn't just for them. The blessing is for you too. Whether it's $100 or a casserole or a card or a phone call, just do it. Oh, he loves when we hear him and obey him. Oh, what a great day. A $100 bill put in my pocket for this purpose. Thank you, Father. Thank you for using me. So now he's going to use me to teach you something or to speak to you about something. And when I was doing this this afternoon or this morning, I, I, I knew that it was for someone very specific. I don't know who it is, but I know someone needs to hear. I mean, and normally I, I teach what God tells me to teach with the understanding that it's going to bless people or, or it's going to speak to, you know, a, somebody. But I don't often get the, the sense that it is for someone very specific. So I don't know who you are, but when you hear this, 
if this is for you, we are praying for you. Know that we are praying over your life through this today. So it's called, you don't have to ring the doorbell. You don't have to ring the doorbell. So uh, John chapter 8, chapter 9, chapter 10, amazing chapters. Uh, chapter 8 le um, leaves off with the disbelief of the Jewish leaders where they're disbelieving what they're hearing and, and seeing. Chapter 9 starts with um, the, the Jesus beautifully revealing his deity again. He heals um, the man that had been blind uh, since birth. And the man who was healed was taken uh, before the Pharisees, you know, those wonderful Pharisees. And they recognized that this man was healed. They see that, they know that he's been blind since birth and that he's now healed. But they were more concerned that Jesus broke the Sabbath. So chapter 10 would be, uh, seem to be a continuation of that whole story um, in the confrontation that followed. But Jesus begins to speak with illustrations of um, sh the shepherding industry at that time to teach a lot of biblical principles in a short little chapter. Um, he uses the, the shepherding or the sheep illustrations because it was a major industry, um, an important industry to the economy of Israel. And Jesus was using an analogy by, that everyone could relate to back then and understand because everybody understood shepherds and sheep and sheep herding and how you treat them and how you handle them and what you do because it was an important part of their economy and they understood it. So Jesus talks about a new order, a new fold, a new flock, everything new um, of which the blind man was going to play a part. So let me read it. It's John chapter 10 verses 7 through 9. John chapter 10, 7 through 9. Then Jesus said to them again, most assuredly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. Now, before Jesus declares himself to be the door, he deals with some other types of people, thieves, robbers, strangers. A thief, uh, I looked it up, a thief is a, one who steals by means of a plan carefully thought out. A thief carefully thought out what he was going to take and how he was going to steal. Hmm, sounds like an enemy we know. Robber. A robber is one who plunders and uses violence. Huh. Wow. A thief is someone who plans, and a robber is someone who uses violence. And Jesus said, All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers. In other words, what he's saying is, These people were out to steal your life to steal from you your hope, your life, your very life, your dreams, anything that you had, they were out to steal. He said, but I am the real door. I am the only door. Thieves and robbers never entered the door of a sheepfold. They would try. They would try to steal sheep by climbing over the walls to get to the sheep to kill them, to throw them back over the wall on the other side. That's how they would operate. They would never come marching through the gate. They would climb over walls secretly by stealth, and they would take a sheep, kill it, and they would throw the sheep on the other side. That's how they would steal, kill, and then devour. Again, 
Sounds like an enemy we know. Sometimes the shepherds left the sheep in the fold in the care of an under-shepherd known as a doorkeeper. Other times the shepherd himself would act as the door of the sheepfold and he would lay and sleep across the entrance of the sheepfold, of the gate. He would literally lay in the gate so that nobody could pass without having to awake him or climb over him. He would sleep and he would literally become the door, the gate. He'd be, he would become the entrance or the exit. No one came in or out of that door except by the shepherd. The door and the shepherd served different functions, but when the shepherd was the door and the door was the shepherd, does Jesus give us the understanding? Remember Psalm, 20, Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want. And so as Jesus as the shepherd is the one who becomes the door of the sheepfold. Now there are a lot of pictures about doors in the scripture. Uh, there are, uh, I'm, I'm looking, I, I have like a half page of scriptures about the door. But my favorite <laughs> Um, Joshua chapter 7 says that God turns a place of trouble. That's what Joshua says. It's, it's a place of trouble into a door of hope. Hosea chapter 2 verse 15 says that. Now, I'm not putting that up. That's just a little aside. That a door of hope, that God turns a place of trouble into a door of hope. Why? Jesus is our hope. He is the door. He is the one that we go through. The idea of a single way to God is not only new, is not new or was not new to the Jews. Remember the configuration of the tabernacle that Moses built? In the tabernacle as outlined in Exodus chapters mm, 25 through 40, somewhere in there, um, there was a door, a gate, that was the only way to the presence of God in the tabernacle. Well, Jesus has pictured as the door as a fulfillment of that Old Testament. It, Psalm 100, verse 4. Oh, gosh, we know this. Psalm 100, verse 4. We enter to his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. We enter his gate. We enter the door. That was how God configured the whole tabernacle that Moses talked about, built, worshipped him. There was only one way into the tabernacle and it was through the gate one way in the door so Jesus comes along and speaks about it and said I am now the way to the presence of God because that's what the tabernacle was all about was getting into the holy of holies where God dwelt on the mercy seat and so now Jesus is declaring I am am the only way to the presence of God. Oh, praise God. What a fulfillment. What an awesome fulfillment. Now, there are some admonitions about the gate or the door. Let me show you what I mean. Matthew 7, 13 through and 14. Matthew 7, 13 and 14. Enter by the narrow gate or the narrow door. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it because narrow is the gate or the door and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. We have found it. We have found that narrow door. And his name is Jesus. And what God's saying is there might be other doors that are broad, they might be ornate and beautiful. 
And he might tempt you to go through that door or that gate. But we can't because narrow is that way to Jesus. Let me give you another one. And this is Matthew 25, 10 through 13. Matthew 25, 10 through 13. And while they went their way to buy, the bridegroom came and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding. And the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came along saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the son or the bridegroom is coming. So what Jesus is saying here is that there is a door. And if we don't, if we don't give our lives over to him now, on this side of eternity, if we don't, and the, we, we call it being saved or letting Jesus into your heart or accepting him and the work of the cross for salvation. If we don't do that, the door is shut. Remember, Jesus said, I am, I am the door in John chapter 10. So he shuts the door. What he does is he closes it by himself. Let me give you one more. Luke chapter 13, verses 24 through 28. Strive to enter through the narrow gate. For many, I say to you, will seek to enter and will not be able to get through that door. When once the master of the house has risen up and shut the door, and you begin to stand outside and knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open for us. And he will answer and say to you, I do not know you. Where you are from, then you will begin to say, we ate and drank in your presence and you taught us in our streets. But he will say, I tell you, I do not know you. Where you are from, depart from me, all you workers of iniquity. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, and you yourselves thrust out. Again, Jesus said, there's a door. And there will be people who will knock on it. Knock, knock, knock. Ring the doorbell. Ring the doorbell. Ring the doorbell. Ring the doorbell. Knock, knock, knock. Ring the doorbell. Ring the doorbell. Knock, knock, knock. And he said, they're wanting to enter. But he said, I, I, I can't let you in because you did not choose me. You did not love me. You rejected me. And you lived your life without me. And so you can't come to me now at the very end and say, I want in. It's harsh sometimes to speak truth. It, it is. It is harsh to speak some truth sometimes. But we have to not just have the feel-good messages of Christmas. We have to have the harder messages that say, he, he's the door. And we don't have to sit there and ring 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 that doorbell. If we choose him now, he is the door and it opens for us. Every door. He, he is the door to our family. He's the door, door to our friendships. He's the door to our workplace. He's the door to our vacations. He, he's the door to our sleeping. He, he's the door to our recreational time. He's our, he's our door for everything. And we don't have to sit there on the outside and ring and ring the doorbell and knock and knock. Because Jesus said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these things should be added unto you. And then he goes on to say, Knock and it will be open. He's not, he's not talking about a pounding. He's talking about a time to come home. Time to come home. And the door opens. This is... A, uh, an amazing group of scriptures that God is showing us today. We enter his doors or his gates with thanksgiving. 
and into his courts with praise that we might bless him and praise him and worship him. So when Jesus lays across the entrance to the sheepfold or the entrance of eternity with him, we don't have to lay on that ring, on that doorbell. Mm-hmm. I can just hear it. Ding, 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 ding. I can hear it. You know why? Because I've done it before for fun. I've laid on someone's doorbell like that. And they're like, oh, stop ringing. Stop ringing my bell, right? Mm-hmm. We, we, we've all just been there and done that. Or most of us maybe who are maybe a little uh, mischievous, perhaps. I was. I was. Probably still am. I'd still lay on somebody's doorbell just for fun. <laughs> so uh, people, people I know, of course, not strangers. Um, So we get to enter that door. So let me go back to the blind man. So the blind man gets healed, and the Pharisees take him in, and they they take him away, and they question him, and it's not a pleasant thing for him. He's trying to defend it the best he can, you know, saying, listen, I was blind, now I see. I I, I don't know much more than that. They want to know what he said and what did Jesus say and what did Jesus do? And they're questioning him. But he entered the door. Here's how we know he entered the door. This is John chapter 9, 35 through 38. Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And when he had found him, he said to him, Do you believe in the Son of God? And he answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe in him? And Jesus said to him, You have both seen him, and it is he who is talking with you. And then he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Can you believe that? I believe. So that's when Jesus said, he looked at him, he said, listen, I say to you, I am the door. Chapter 10 again, I'm the door. And whoever comes before me, we're we're robbers and thieves, but I am the real deal. I am the real one. And he who enters by me will have life. Well, that blind man was not only healed by of his blindness, But he was spiritually healed, and he said to Jesus, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. Can you you imagine that Jesus says to, to us, I am the door, I am the way, I am the Son of God, I am the Messiah. Do you believe? And the blind man said, yes, I believe. And he worshiped Jesus. Folks, there's a door. And it's the door of salvation. And we don't have to, like I said a million times already in this lesson, we don't have to lay on that doorbell. We don't have to ring the doorbell. We just need to, a small knock, and Jesus opens the door. And he lets us in. And when he lets us in, He takes over as the shepherd of our lives. He takes over as the one who protects us, who provides for us, who cares for us, feeds us, watches out for us, and defeats prowlers, thieves, robbers, Satan on our behalf and for us. That's what the shepherd does. And Jesus said, I am the door of the sheep. I'm the door of the sheep. And if anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will not go. And will go in and not be shut out and find that they're missing eternity with him. 
In fact, he says they will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. They will find a wonderful place to live. This is what Jesus is declaring to us today. We have to choose him. And we have to choose him only. We can't choose Jesus and then say, well, if I go to church a number of times, I'll be fine. We can't choose Jesus and say, okay, well, I've got to go through this hoop and this hoop and this hoop. And I have to do this to my hair or do this to my shoes. Uh, you don't have to do anything. You don't have to wear anything right. You don't have to, you don't have to um, be anything other than what he's created you to be and what he will make of you as you give your life to him. He is the door. He is the only way to God. No one else and nothing else. Listen, you can't sing enough praise songs if you do not know him to get you into heaven. You cannot teach enough Sunday school classes if your heart is not fully devoted to him and just, and figure you're going to get into heaven. You can't give a, live a good life only with outside of him. You can't live an ethical life absent of Jesus. He is the only way to the Father. If you do not know this Jesus, this shepherd of our lives, he's my shepherd. Jehovah Rohi, the Lord, the shepherd. Mm. If you do not know Jesus, will you let us introduce you to him? Call us at the ministry. We'll talk to you and pray you through it. Or get online and send us an email at brushstrokeministries.com. Go through the website, Brushstroke Ministries, and let us know and let us help you because we want to lead you to him. He loves you with an amazing love. And he's painting a picture with you one brushstroke at a time. So God bless you. Thank you for watching today's program, One Brushstroke at a Time. If you have been blessed by this study, would you share your story with us? We want to hear how God is moving in hearts all around the globe. If you have a question, would like more information, or would like to request prayer, please visit our website at brushstrokeministries.com or connect with us on Facebook at Brushstroke Ministries. You may also contact us at Brushstroke Ministries, P.O. Box 2353, Buchanan, West Virginia, 26201. Join Jenny Fister every week at this time to hear a fresh revelation as she paints a beautiful picture of his word, one brushstroke at a time.